straight to LA. Our federal prosecutors are speaking about high profile attorney uh, Tom Girardi, who was convicted of four counts of wire fraud and for running a massive 10 year Ponzi scheme. Let's listen in. Girardi portrayed himself as a champion for the little guy. He marketed himself as a lawyer for Aaron Brockovich. He cultivated an image of a lawyer who fought against corporate greed and even claimed to be himself a champion of justice. He even had a radio sh show by that name. But Mr. Girardi was no champion of justice. In fact, he was a perpetrator of injustice, victimizing his own clients when they were most vulnerable and most in need. To understand the full depravity and the shame of what Mr. Girardi did, it's important to understand the context. First, the greed. Mr. Girardi was a lawyer who had it all. He was considered one of the best lawyers in America. He had one of the biggest and most successful firms in America. He had great influence with other lawyers and with judges. He even portrayed himself repeatedly as one of the top lawyers in America in magazines and other publications. And he was paid very well for all that he did. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted even more. His insatiable appetite for money is what led him to court and what led to this verdict today. Secondly, it's important to understand the breach of trust involved in what Mr. Girardi did. As lawyers, we all have duties to our clients, duties of trust to our clients. Mr. Girardi had that duty of trust, but especially with the clients that he had, people who were most vulnerable, people who had gone through traumatic incidents, people who were desperately in need of his help, people who were not lawyers and relied on his expertise. Yet Mr. Girardi chose to take advantage of those very same clients, those vulnerable people, the ones who'd gone through traumatic incidents in order to enrich himself. This is what I mean by truly repugnant and shameful conduct. We know that today's verdict cannot repair all the damage that has been done by Mr. Girardi, but we hope that the fact that he has been brought to justice, that a verdict has been found and he's been found guilty of four counts of wire fraud will bring some comfort to the many victims of his reprehensible conduct. I will now bring to the podium, or the virtual podium, Special Agent in Charge of IRS Criminal Investigation, Tyler Hatcher. Thank you, Martine. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> As stated, I'm Tyler Hatcher. I'm the Special Agent in Charge of IRS Criminal Investigation. I wanna thank U.S. Attorney Martin Estrada and his, his team and our team during the, uh, the lengthy process of this trial. Today's guilty verdict is another example of work in safeguarding victims of fraud. Approximately two years ago, Martina Estrada uh, challenged us in IRS criminal investigation and our other federal partners to take an aggressive stance and to hold those who uh, betray public, the public's trust, accountable for those actions. And I think today's guilty verdict highlights our efforts in holding professionals in positions of trust accountable. The evidence displayed during trial showed that Mr. Girardi exploited his clients in their various times of need. Many of his clients suffered life-altering injuries and other uh, catastrophes. And instead of ensuring timely payment on their lawsuits, Mr. Girardi used those awards to fund his lavish lifestyle and to pay other settlements. Unfortunately for him, IRS criminal investigation special agents are the best in the world at following the money uh, especially when, when fraud leaves that trail. <clears throat> I want to also reflect on the guilty verdict as uh, our outstanding investigative work by IRS Criminal Investigation, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and our partners at FBI. It should serve as an example for those who, try, who might try to follow Mr. Girardi's footsteps that we will hold you accountable. Protecting vulnerable citizens is some of the most rewarding work that we do at IRS Criminal Investigation. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ted Dox, special agent in charge of FBI Los Angeles Criminal Division. With this verdict, Thomas Girardi is finally being held accountable for his egregious actions. For years, Mr. Girardi 
has built callously his clients to gain for only his self interest and for greed. Uh, this is a case in which the FBI will always, we will always exude every, every resource to get individuals like this because this is something that we take very seriously and we know impacts the community. Mr. Girardi also, he was very, he took his position as a lawyer and he actually, he betrayed the trust of so many folks within the community here today. I will tell you that the FBI is grateful for the partnerships we have with IRS, Criminal Investigative Division, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office to hold these individuals accountable. They were significant in their assistance in helping to bring this particular case to a successful outcome. Thank you. So I'll now take questions. Before I do that, I want to give thanks where it's deserved. The IRS and the FBI did a phenomenal and comprehensive investigation in this case. They were very thorough, left no stone unturned. I also want to particularly recognize the assistant United States attorneys in my office responsible for this. They would say Scott Patey and Ali Mogadas. I also want to note some of the investigators in this case, particularly IRS agents Ryan Roberson, Ryan Iwamoto, Ryan Bennett, and FBI Special Agent Elias Guerrero. Now take questions. I have two questions. Well, one is for you. So he's 85 years old, and he's in an assisted living center, a memory care center in Orange County. What's going to happen with him at sentencing? Do you send an 85-year-old man to prison, or could you be put on house arrest, or how does this work? So sentencing is set for December of this year. I believe it's December 6th, if I'm not mistaken. Just to make sure I get you an accurate date. Yes, December 6th is the sentencing in this case. We are not going to prejudge that. We will look at all the facts as they come in. There will be a comprehensive report that is prepared by the probation department. We will look at all the facts in terms of recommending our sentence. But the mere fact that he is older, an older adult, does not mean we will not seek prison time. It's important in a case like this not only to punish the wrongdoer, but to send a message to others out there who would think of doing the same thing, that there will be serious consequences for this type of misconduct. What's the range of uh, sentencing options? So the statutory maximum sentence he faces for four counts of wire fraud is 80 years in federal prison. There is something called the sentencing guidelines. We will look at that to determine what the appropriate sentence is. Again, we have to look at all the facts and circumstances. And by the way, another important part of sentencing is hearing from the victims. The victims will have a right to address the court, either personally or in writing. And that will certainly affect the ultimate sentence that he receives. Uh, you mentioned that he was funding a lavish lifestyle. Can you elaborate on that? How was he able to go undetected for so many years? I think you heard a lot about that in court, how he was a very successful lawyer and made millions and millions of dollars, but he essentially operated a vast and comprehensive Ponzi scheme. And so he'd pay out some and take others and steal money over time, as we heard in court. And of course, he had a very lavish lifestyle. You just have to watch a little bit of television to see how lavishly he was living. Um, how you had a question, yes? Yeah, so what's the exact number? I know initially it was reported that he embezzled more than 15 million, the release has tens of millions. Is there a number that we could so we will leave it at tens of millions of dollars. We now need to do further uh, looking at the facts. The probation department will look uh, because we had, in this case, certainly four victims whose stories were heard. Uh, we expect other victims to come forward and hear more about some of the issues they dealt with, which will likely increase the loss at issue in this case. The fact that Girardi put in, you know, 80 to 100 million dollars of his own money back into the firm, how does that fit in with your narrative? I won't confirm any amounts, so I don't know how much money he actually Tens of put into. No, I, don't, I won't confirm any amount. I won't confirm any amount that he actually put in. But in a Ponzi scheme, as you heard at trial, it's very typical for someone to keep the Ponzi scheme running by putting in some funds of their own. That doesn't mean he did not steal money. That doesn't mean he's not guilty of a fraud offense. And it doesn't mean that he left many, many victims irreparably damaged by his actions. How did you break the 
you're going to have prosecutors actually ask the judge to consider uncharged victims at sentencing, victims who were not part of the trial, you're going to want them to consider those situations for sentencing. So in every case, there is uh, the potential to look more comprehensively at the conduct of the defendant things that were not necessarily brought out of trial. It's known as relevant conduct in the federal system. And we want to do a comprehensive look at everything Mr. Girardi is responsible for. Yes. I had a question for the FBI or IRS special agents. How did you guys break this case? Like, what was the first thing where you're like, something's not right here? No, that's, that's a great question. In IRS criminal investigation, we get involved when there's a lot of money. And as you can imagine, you know, victims need to be heard. And that's one thing that we pay very, very close attention to. As I said in my comments, um, we've taken an aggressive approach to essentially trying to make victims whole. So in this case, you know, victims are very loud when they start losing money. So they came to you guys and said something's not right? Essentially. I will say from the FBI perspective. There, so these, uh, a federal jury had just, has just found a uh, very high profile, well-known, uh, uh, disgraced now uh, attorney, former attorney Tom Girardi, guilty of wire fraud for embezzling more than $15 million from his clients. Okay, that sounds like, okay, who is this guy already? He's a high profile attorney. You got to see some of the headlines that are coming across right now as I'm going through the wires. Former Real Housewives husband Tom Girardi found guilty of wire fraud in embezzlement case. He's being tied uh, to his estranged wife who, uh, well, there's all kinds of connections to big money and what she was trying to do, uh, someone 30 years younger than he is. He's 85 years old now, uh, and it doesn't look like uh, the remaining years of his life are going to go so well since he's been found guilty now of embezzling so much money from his clients. Where you probably remember him as a lawyer is he was once really a legal titan that earned a huge amount of money uh, for plane crash and burn victims. But, you know, the big suit that got him a lot of attention and it was based after an Oscar uh, winning film was when uh, he he took in that big settlement against uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, um, a case that was featured in a film that most of us well know Aaron Brockovich. Uh, for more, let's bring in our ABC's Alex Stone. He's been uh, not only covering this ongoing saga, but Alex, you know so much more uh, than I do when it comes to all his big cases. I had actually forgotten about Tom Girardi for a while and that this was even going forward. And now it looks like uh, things have not turned out so well uh, for the former uh, big time attorney. And there's a lot of evidence to prove why. Well, Kira, yeah, now you talk about all of the, the big cases, the, the big PG&E explosion that, that happened years ago. Some of these who have been impacted uh, that allegedly and now a jury saying that, that he did take money from them, that they were involved in that case. You talk about Erica Jane. Uh, the allegation here has been that he used this money not only for private jets and for golf club memberships, but to fund her career, to put money toward her music career, toward her television career that this money illegally came from settlements that should not have been going to him and then went to fund her time in the spotlight to get her career going. So the allegation is that it was a lot of money. The jury today saying you are right, prosecutors. He did steal the money and uh, now he's been convicted. So what what more do we know about this 10 year massive 10 year Ponzi scheme uh, that prosecutors say he was running? Uh, do we know any more details on how, you know, that was that was working? Yeah, the, the allegation we've seen this with other high profile attorneys as well is that money that was coming in that should have been going to the victims that they were fighting to get that he was taking some of that money and putting money back into to funding some clients by taking money from the, the settlement of other clients. And it was just this system that, that he had going. But with the money illegally going to him to be on those private jets, to fund his then wife's career, and that, that it was money that did not belong to him. These were huge settlements. We're talking hundreds of thousands in some cases, uh, millions of dollars, tens of millions that allegedly, and, and again, the, the jury now is saying it's not only allegedly, that, that he was taking a bigger cut than he should have been.
Got it. Now I understand how, how it was working. And, you know, and if you take a deep dive, I mean, at one point he was one of the best lawyers in America. I mean, it was known to be a champion for the little guy. So it seems like when he first started out decades ago, you know, his intentions were all about doing the right thing. Well, at least that's what his team would say. And, and they say that, that he did the right thing all the way to the end. They say, look at him now. In that video that you saw a moment ago, he is 85 years old. He's got dementia now. And they're saying this wasn't his fault, that it was the manager in his office. Here he is walking into to court right here. And you can see his condition at the beginning. His attorneys tried to make the point that he wasn't even in a condition to go to trial and that, that he should not have been put on trial because of his dementia right now and that he doesn't know what's going on. But their allegation being, or their claim on the, the side of the defense, saying, look, he's old, he doesn't know what is going on right now, and that, that he didn't know that this money was being taken, that he didn't do it. Blame somebody else. Well, prosecutors said no. Over this amount of time, he knew what he was doing, and they said blame him, and today the jury did that. All right. Well, we'll follow, of course, uh, what happens next. More to come. Alex Stone, appreciate it. Thank you so much.